All right. Thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to discuss. Um, I want to start with a little bit of a comment for people that aren't used to thinking about machine learning and finance and in asset pricing in particular. Um, I think when you first get exposed to this stuff, there's a lot of reason to feel skeptical. Right? And so I want to make a couple points with respect to that comment. First of all, I think about empirical asset pricing as a whole of having a severe measurement problem. Okay? So this is related to the explainable variation point that Marcus raised, this 1% R squared. The thing that empirical asset pricing is predicated on measuring <clears throat> the expected return is a tiny part of what we ever get to see. Okay? So if we can improve our measurement of that small component of the total return, we're going to put ourselves in a much better position to understand asset pricing from a theoretical perspective. Okay? So measurement, I would argue, is especially first order in the asset pricing context. The second is that a lot of the skepticism that I think people have a reaction to have is about overfit, right? Or data mining. Okay. So I want to make a couple points specifically on that, especially if you, if you haven't seen this literature before. The findings that you see when you bring machine learning methods to describing patterns and returns are extremely robust. They work out of sample in a way that is very intuitive. And I think probably even the stronger evidence that this is not about overfit is this is the way that the asset management industry has decided to reorient itself. Okay. There's an enormous amount of effort in the industry trying to think about how we can incorporate these methods in the way we build portfolios. Again, we have this knee-jerk reaction, okay, that might be useful if we're thinking about things like HFT. It's not true. We're doing this stuff, we're talking about long horizon predictability, long holding periods and returns, types of portfolios that we build, for example, for pension plans. All right, so that's big picture motivation. So I think this is a very important question that Marcus is working on, all right? It's an important paper in an important area, in my view. And I think the model that Marcus brings to the table is a very interesting and valuable expansion of the frontier that's already started to develop in the literature. Okay? So I'm going to spend um, my comments. I could spend a lot of time talking about this. I'm going to spend my comments really on one main substantive, substantive point in the model. But before we get there, of course, I want to spend a little bit kind of laying out what's happening here. All right. So I think it's important to put in context the contribution of this paper. It's something that I actually don't think came across very clearly in Marcus's presentation. There's been a lot of work using machine learning methods to understand asset pricing. All right? And a lot of the comparison that gets done in Marcus's paper is to a pure prediction machine learning setup. All right? This is not what Marcus is going after. Marcus is trying to go after risk pricing, risk compensation, measuring an SDF with machine learning. We have a lot of work in that area, too. So he alludes to papers like Kozak, Nagel, and Santosh. But I actually think the more direct comparisons are these papers here. So these should show up as benchmarks. Right? The, model, the paper's not properly benchmarked currently. All right. A lot of the conclusions that are emphasized are not the main conclusions of the paper, in my view. They're things we sort of already knew. Things like you can use ML for cross-sectional pricing. You can use it to build good portfolios. You can impose no arbitrage no arbitrage restri restrictions while doing machine learning. Nonlinearities and interaction effects are critical. Macroeconomic conditions are critical. These are all things that show up in the literature already. Okay. But I told you, I like this paper a lot. I think it's an important paper. So why is that? It's because we're learning how to use GANs and LSTM for asset pricing. All right. But very few of the results pointed to exactly how these end up being useful. The paper needs to draw that out. I'm going to spend a lot of time now talking about this adversarial network approach to modeling asset markets. I think this is the most important contribution of the paper. Okay? At the end, I might allude to, if I have time, I'll talk about LSTM a little bit. This is the most important contribution of the paper. So I want to spend some time on that. All right. So um, let me give you a quick sort of overview of machine learning for asset pricing, in, particularly, in particular factor models. Okay? So this literature begins you know, with the the canonical formulation. It has a view of a conditional pricing model, so these betas are conditional. Right? And all of the work in this literature is to say, listen, I'm going to treat this factor as latent. It's actually not a really big assumption, but it's important. All right? It's important because you give yourself a lot more flexibility to capture cross-sectional behavior in asset prices. But once you make that latent factor assumption, all of the work now goes 
into modeling the beta, okay? So this entire literature all proceeds from essentially the same starting point. I'm gonna write down a model for beta. It's gonna be a function of some stuff. The stuff is information about the individual firm whose beta we're talking about, crossed with information about the overall state of the economy. All right. Now the ML view, the machine learning view of this beta function is that I wanna be really open-minded about what could be driving those betas, all right? I wanna consider large information sets that show up in that beta function. But I still wanna restrict myself to a low dimensional factor structure because I think that's the economic content of asset pricing models, all right? So we're talking about a mapping from a lot of information, a lot of vari variables, a high dimensional problem to a low dimensional factor structure. One thing that's kind of cool about this is once you write down your beta specification, you really don't need to worry about modeling factors. You get them for free. You always get them optimally from a cross-sectional regression of asset returns onto the beta function that you've estimated. All right, so all of the work goes into modeling the beta. Okay, so let me give you some examples from the literature. First example, IPCA. All right, so what does IPCA do? It writes down this function and it makes a modeling choice for what the beta looks like. Okay, there's a set of information. Think of it as just a p-dimensional vector of firm characteristics. Oftentimes what you do is you interact the firm characteristics with macro variables, so you expand out that vector. But still, we're just talking about firm characteristics. That firm characteristic list can be huge. It could be a thousand characteristics, all right? The machine learning aspect of this is to say, how do I map a thousand characteristics into two or three betas for the individual firm? The answer, in this linear model, you just find the three best linear combinations of those characteristics that capture beta, that capture covariation among firms. That's what this gamma matrix is. It's just a choice, it's a statistically driven, a data driven choice for what is the right combination of a big dimensional information set to measure firm betas, okay. All right, so that's IPCA, that's the linear model, one of the linear models that Marcus was alluding to and that I think you should benchmark against. Here's another one. This is a more complicated one. This is my autoencoder asset pricing models paper. What this does is say, listen, I wanna think about this beta function, again, as a function of information, just like we were doing in the linear case, but I don't wanna restrict myself to linearity. I wanna take that big p-dimensional information set and map it into a small number of k factors. How do you do that? Well, we say you can use a neural network for that. That's exactly what they're designed for. So, this is a representation of what the neural network looks like. I start with a whole bunch of different firm characteristics. So this is gonna be a row for each firm. This could be value, momentum, accruals, size, and so forth. And what I'm gonna do is the neural network's going to allow me to consider all kinds of complicated interactions and transformations of those characteristics when I'm deciding on a beta function, okay? This is a non-parametric approach or a semi-parametric approach to building betas. If our linear assumptions have led us astray, this should clean it up, all right? That's the idea. And it ends up working quite well in practice. All right, so this is the baseline. This is where Marcus is starting from. His model can really be thought of as starting from this point of view. It's a slightly different view of the world because he's doing it in SDF space. I'm doing it in factor space, but of course these are equivalent. All right, so. What Marcus does is extremely clever. He says, listen, let's treat this as a GMM problem with conditional moment equations. Thanks. Okay, so I'm gonna move a little bit faster. <laughs> these moment conditions, these Gs here, right? Hansen tells us, of course, these are just synthetic payoff vectors. I'm building portfolios. The weighting function, the, the moment function, is just a way of choosing portfolio weights, right? It's designing test assets. I'm gonna pick an SDF to best describe the return patterns that I see in my collection of test assets, which are the product of the returns and the moment condition. All right, the, the instrument, okay. So already in this formulation, by the way, we can do machine learning, right? This M function, the SDF that I'm trying to estimate, it can be a neural network model. I can just do GMM where I'm estimating a neural network, okay? Just allowing for a flexible functional form here. So that's, that's not novel, all right? The problem is if you wanna do GMM here, you have a lot of hard decisions to make. So first of all, 
All of the standard assumptions we make in asset pricing, they imply an infinite number of moment conditions. All right? So how do you pick? Well, you can't impose all of them. Knowing which ones to, to pick is hard. So you have a hard problem to solve. Economic researchers solve this by just making a choice. They make your, you know, an economically motivated choice. But what if that choice is not a good one? Well, you can correct it. You can use machine learning to correct it. You can use a data-driven choice of what those moment conditions should look like. And that's where the adversary comes in, all right? This idea of adversarial GMM shows up in the literature. Very interesting 2018 paper, if you want to take a look. The basic idea is that, listen, you give me a proposal for an SDF. Imagine there's an adversary out there that's going to try and find all the portfolios that are most poorly priced by that SDF. Well, that's what the adversary does. This is a very powerful idea for improving the performance of models. Okay? So let me give you an example. Suppose your candidate SDF is the Fama French five-factor model. What is the adversary going to do? Well, of course, they're going to go out and pick those moment conditions to build momentum portfolios, because FF5 doesn't price momentum. Gene and Ken gave up on that. All right. So this is a fascinating idea. What it's really doing, it's combining two ideas. It's combining an old idea of robust control. All right. So this is kind of Hanson Sargent views of the world. Robust control means that you're building in this adversary. The adversary's helping you estimate better. It's pointing out to you iteratively all the flaws your models had in it in the previous iteration. All right, so that's a powerful improvement. Next, it's semi-parametric. It brings the flexibility of a neural network here. So you could do adversarial learning without a neural network in that function, right? I could just pick a big list of moments, and the adversary could choose which of those to overweight and underweight. This says you don't even have to pick that list. You can just have a general function and figure out what are appropriate moments to approximate with semi-parametric statistics. All right, this is a great idea. Great idea to bring it to asset pricing. All right, so what are the problems? All right, so I think there's, there's actually a pretty important problem to deal with here. Um, and the, the idea is, is the following. So I, I think of this as a realistic scenario. Okay, so you have a subset of assets that are mispriced in the economy, right? I.e., there's reliable return predictability without much risk there. Okay, so that's my realistic scenario that I'm starting with. Another aspect of this scenario, there are smart traders out there. They know that predictability is there, but they don't exploit it because they also know that it's costly to trade it. There are limits to arbitrage. So what does that mean? Well, there's predictability out there. When the econometrician looks at it, they find it. When the adversary looks at it, they find that predictability. Okay. It's not necessarily interesting predictability. It's limits to arbitrage predictability. It might be interesting, but it might not be what you're really looking for in the SDF. Okay. So what will the adversary do? It's always going to search for the SDF that, that rationalizes this on-paper predictability that investors in the marketplace know they can't access because of, say, trading costs. All right. So what is the problem then? The problem is that the SDF hones in on the predictability in the places where it's sort of least economically interesting, places where there's high idiosyncratic risk, lots of illiquidity, and so forth. Severe limits to arbitrage. All right. So here's an additional plausible scenario. Suppose that in that world I just considered, that if I got rid of the limits to arbitrage, the prices would equilibrate to an economically meaningful SDF. All right. Well, what do I want to do as an economist then? What I really want to do is understand what is that economically meaningful SDF absent the trading costs, absent the limits to arbitrage. I think that's a really interesting economic question. I might also want to know the nature of the limits to arbitrage. I really want to separate these. Okay, but that's not what this method does. Instead, right, what I want to tell my estimator to do, right, is I want to say, listen, I know there are places where I can't trade because of limits to arbitrage. Model, go away from those. Find the predictability that's not associated with the limits to arbitrage. Find the predictability that's associated with risk compensation, right? That is overweight the assets that are correctly priced by that SDF. Okay. That's exactly the opposite of what the GAN does. The GAN says pay attention to the places where we find mispricings that might be driven by limits to ARB. Okay, so in the end, what we end up with are potentially limits to arbitrage-driven errors, and we conflate them with the SDF. We're trying to shoehorn those limits to ARB errors into the SDF, and this confounds the economics, economic conclusions. 
So I'm out of time, but let me just say that I think this is potentially a really exciting way to think about trying to improve this type of setup. Brilliant idea to introduce this idea of adversarial learning into asset pricing, but there's a lot to do with it. And we have to confront some of these issues, some of these, these realities of financial markets. I have some additional comments um, so over time. I'll gloss through those. But let me just say, a lot of interesting work in this paper that I just have no time to talk about. Um, and I, I, don't want this to, I don't want my comments to overshadow the bigger point. This is a very creative idea, an important contribution, and I expect there to be a lot of follow-on contributions that build upon this idea. All right, so thank you.